السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. إن شاء الله we will commence with a short recitation from the Quran and I pray that we can all be silent and listen very carefully and attentively. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. لا أقسم بها. أحسب أن لن يقدر عليه أحد يقول أهلكت مالا لبدا أيحسب أن لم يره أحد ألم نجعل له عينين ولسانا وشفتين وهديناهم نجدين فلقد حمى العقبة وما أدراك ما العقبة فك رقبة أو إطعام في يوم ذي مسغبة يتيما ذا مقربة أو مسكينا ذا متربة ثم كان من الذين آمنوا وتواصوا بالصبر وتواصوا وتواصوا بالصبر وتواصوا بالمرحمة أولئك أصحاب الميمنة والذين كفروا بآياتنا هم أصحاب المشأمة عليهم نار مؤصدة الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد we commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household and all his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them and to bless us all and our offspring, those to come up to the day of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all. May He keep us steadfast and them as well. And may He be pleased with us all. Ameen. Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, this afternoon, inshallah, we will be speaking about the goodly life. And we will be concentrating on how sometimes a moment of pleasure that seems to be pleasurable can actually result in disaster that is everlasting. Subhanallah. May the Almighty protect us. May the Almighty grant us goodness. And may He make us distinguish between right and wrong. And at the same time, may He grant us the acceptance to follow the path of goodness and to protect ourselves from the path of evil. Amen. In life, we as mu'mineen should be concentrating on what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of us should be engaged on a daily basis in items, things, deeds, statements that are within the pleasure of the Almighty because the whole aim and purpose of being in this world is in order to seize the opportunity of this particular life to pack away as many good deeds as possible 
So that when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our suitcases can be full of good deeds. And we can have records that will be filled with that which is good. May the Almighty protect us from that which is bad and evil. So the aim of life is to worship Allah, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why we are mu'mineen. And this is the reason why we consider ourselves favored because we have understood why we have been created. Allah says it in the Quran. I'm sure we would all know it off by heart. We should be knowing it off by heart. Because a question you would ask yourself, I would ask myself and any normal human being would have to ask himself or herself at some point in his or her life is why was I made? Why was I created? And because Allah created us, He knows that this question is only normal to be asked by one and all. So He answers it. And He says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind or jinn kind except that they worship me. That's the reason why I made them. And I've spoken to young people who say, Is that it? Is that how boring it is? Astaghfirullah. Don't let shaitan make you think for a moment that that is boring. No. It is Allah telling you that I've only created you so that you worship me. But perhaps you don't understand what is meant by the term worship. What is meant by the term worship is Anything and everything you do in your life, make sure it is within the pleasure of the Almighty and it is not within His displeasure. Then you will be engaged in perpetual worship even whilst you are sleeping. Make sure you don't snore because then we were speaking with some of my relatives here telling me that subhanAllah there are people who commit atrocities against their own wives by snoring all night. Allah protect us. I don't think that's a weapon of mass destruction. It's only a nose or a throat. Allahu Akbar. So my brothers and sisters, you need to know when you are sleeping or when you go to sleep, how is it that you went into bed? What was your intention? What were the prayers you made? Did you realize what sleep is? And do you know you may not get up? If you are, if you are conscious of this and you've said your prayers and so on, even during your sleep, you will be written as a person who is involved in an act of wish. Subhanallah. Because you are conscious of it. And when you get up, what do you say as soon as you get up? All praise is due to Allah who has given me life after He had given me the sleep which is equivalent to a certain type of death. Allahu Akbar. Some people pass away in their sleep and they have a very straightforward, simple death. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Make us from those who realize and recognize that He is indeed the greatest. He can do whatever He wants and nobody can ask Him. When we do things, we are answerable, we are questionable. And this brings me to another meaning of the term, worshipping Allah. Anything and everything you do, be conscious of the fact that Allah is going to ask you about it. You are answerable. Really. How did you do this? Why did you do this? When did you do it? And even sometimes, why did you not do certain things? If that is the instruction of Allah, you have no option but to involve in it. If Allah instructs you to dress appropriately within certain limits and scope, Wallahi, if you think you have an option, you are fighting with Allah. وَمَا كَانَ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ it is not for a believing male or female that when Allah and His Rasul have dictated something that they think in their hearts that we still have a choice about it. No, you don't. Once there is a dictation from Allah and His Rasul, your choice is eradicated. It's no longer there. That is why you are called a submitter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. What's the point of calling ourselves Muslimin? Muslim is one who submits. al Islamu lillah. One who submits unto Allah, surrenders. Whatever Allah says, it, ha- it should be happening. So that is why we are Muslimin. So how can we call ourselves Muslim and at the same time think that I have a choice? If I'd like to do this, I can. If I don't want to, I don't have to. Well then, why are you calling yourself a submitter when you're lying? You're not really a submitter. 
Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May He make it easy for us. This is why, my brothers and sisters, what I want to speak about today is very important. Every action of yours has a reaction. Remember that. Everything you do will either return to you in goodness or in something similar to what you have done if it was not goodness. Through Allah's mercy, when you do a good deed, He may multiply it. The reward may come to you in so many different ways. And he may multiply it not only tenfold, but up to seven hundredfold and beyond, depending on the deed and your sincerity. But through his mercy, when you do a bad deed, he recompenses you. If you have not returned to him and engaged in tawbah within a specific time frame, in that particular case, what will happen? He will recompense you with exactly what you deserve, not multiplied. This is something that we learn from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. You do a good deed, you intend a good deed, and you were unable to do it, you're rewarded with your intention. You intend a good deed and you do it, it is multiplied for you depending on the sincerity and the action itself. You intend a bad deed and you do not do it at times, you may be rewarded to have abstained for the sake of Allah. Because abstention from haram for the sake of Allah is indeed a great act of worship. And if you intend a bad deed and end up doing it, next to your name is one sin. Allah doesn't multiply it. Look at the mercy of Allah. Look at the mercy of Allah. And when we say Allah gives you time and respite, every person, every time and every deed has different timings before they are overtaken by that recompense. So there's no time frame that is in minutes or hours or days or years before the punishment may overtake you. But Allah knows. He releases you. He gives you a chance. Then Allah says, Inna ajal Allahi idha jaa la yu'akhar When the fixed time of Allah comes, when the prescribed moment comes, it will not be delayed, not at all. So your moment of pleasure that was in the displeasure of Allah, you will pay for it. But Allah's mercy says, if you want not to pay for it, there is a way out. Press the delete button. And when you press the delete button, it's not enough. You need to press enter. I'm sure you know that, don't you? Go back to your laptops, your computers, your phones, whatever you want. Press delete. Normally, you'd have to press enter thereafter. You can press delete, but it may not delete. Nowadays, you might have settings that might allow you to delete it. I know how people are thinking fast, you know. Say, Sheikh, you're wrong, you know. I can just press delete and it's gone. Well, you can press undo as well. Do you know that? Go back to it. We you know. Allahu Akbar. You think fast? MashaAllah, we try to keep up with you. So my brothers and sisters, you delete and you enter. That means, I, are you sure you want to delete this? They ask you. You say, yes, I'm sure. Delete it. It's gone. Wiped out. Totally out. We've changed our life. Then Allah says, now the recompense will not come because it has found a different path. I am treading a path of disobedience. Recompense is coming to me through that path. And suddenly delete, my path is changed. It misses me, gone. Subhanallah. Look at the mercy of Allah. So when you do bad, remember it's coming back to haunt you. Remember that. It's coming back to haunt you. There's no two ways out. It is coming either in this world and the next or just in this world or just in the next depending on what Allah wants for you and for me may Allah forgive our shortcomings this is why if we learn the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he spent time of the day every single day saying oh Allah forgive me astaghfirullah oh Allah I seek forgiveness I repent and remember there is a difference between tawbah and istighfar istighfar is to say I seek your forgiveness, O oh Allah. And tawbah is to return to Allah. So we need istighfar and tawbah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. I seek your forgiveness and on top of that, I'm now returning to you. Which means I'm no longer going to go back to that path. Some people say astaghfirullah, they mean it, but they go back. Like I said, undo. So we've gone back. What happens? That comes back into your computer in the form of a virus. May Allah protect us, really. My brothers and sisters, Allah is so merciful. I'd like to give you a few examples from real life. And these are examples that will help you. You know, the way you carry yourself and the way you go 
and what you do really plays a big role in what's going to happen to your future in the dunya and the akhirah. Did you ever know that? How you dress also affects your future. And I know people have met their spouses sometimes in a nightclub. It happens. And what happens thereafter? If they end up getting married, well I told you they met their spouses, meaning they are married, I'd like to hope. They get married after they've met in a nightclub. Unless Allah's mercy overtakes them by them engaging in istighfar and searching for the truth, Wallahi, they will have to pay for that heavily, heavily. So, let me get this straight. If you engage in istighfar, you can still delete the, the mistakes you've made in the past. But sometimes you have to pay for a long, long time going into the akhirah. You know, you, you, you were dressed in miniskirts and that's when your, your man, your guy, the guy of your dreams saw you, he noticed you, he looked at you, he winked at you, you winked back, subhanallah. <laughs> subhanallah. Then what happened? He was attracted to what? Your legs. It's a fact. <laughs> and he married your legs, not your heart. Did you know that? The men get married to your hair, your legs, your facial expressions and so on. Not your heart, not your character, not your deen. And thereafter what happens? A time comes when you develop a little bit of an arthritis on your legs. That's from Allah. And sometimes it's so cold, you know, here, so you've got to cover them up. And maybe you have to have a bandage. There comes an age when your room smells of Vicks. Do you know what's Vicks? <laughs> and after that, husband's not, not at home. But where are you? Looking at other legs. Why? Because that's what I like in you in the first place. That's what I like in women. Legs. Allahu Akbar. Wallahi, if he was attracted to your deen and your khuluq, your legs would have been covered. It would have been a mystery for him, subhanallah. And at the same time, he would have been attracted to someone who is covered. If he, that type of a person was attracted towards you because you are trying to achieve the pleasure of Allah, it means he too would like through you to achieve the pleasure of Allah and perhaps to have offspring who will be on similar lines. Then what will happen? 30 years down the line, 40 years down the line, when both of you are in bed, he'll say, darling, you're my angel. And you look at him and start crying. Allahu Akbar. Because you know, this man loves me for, for the fact that I'm trying to earn the pleasure of Allah. That's it. And he hasn't abused that, not at all. And even though I'm wrinkled up, perhaps hunchbacked, but to him, I'm the most important person here at the moment. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us beauty. Why I give this example? There are too many people who select a spouse because of a temporary disobedience that they had engaged in. Short term, you were happy. Allah gave you the most beautiful hair and you decided, let me flick it. Wow, comes one this way, you know, something here. The other day, we were passing in Bolton, you know, and near the train station, I think the university was released. And you know, I try my best. I try my best. I'm also a human being, wallahi. You need to know that. You know, people really raise you high above whatever you are. But the truth is, human being. And as I looked across, I noticed someone with hair. And I said, this is the meaning of a camel hump. I don't know, it was... <laughs> Allah, it went up and I'm thinking, Ajib. And obviously it did not attract me at all, but I was shocked. And when I looked down, I said to myself, A'udhu Billah, people look so satanic and they really think they're cool. It's cool to look like a devil, Allah. Is that what it is? Half the time we don't even know Half the time we don't even know what we're doing is actually a satanic ritual. Do you know that? It's a ritual. It is an act of worship of the devil worshippers. And we as mu'minin think, okay, let me take that black, whatever it's called, and bring it right to the corner here. Let it come all the way up here, not realizing that's how they worship the devil. Go and see, subhanAllah. Today we have Google and YouTube and all this. And it's not difficult to find out where it came from and how it started. And our sisters are doing that. My sister, if a guy is attracted to you like that, he's the guy you're supposed to be furthest away from. Because that is the guy who's going to take you away from your deen. The day you realize you made a mistake, he will not allow you to turn to Allah because he's going to keep on telling you, hey, take that scarf off. When I married you, you didn't have it. When I married you, you had an inch of icing on your face and I want it back there. 
Yes. And that's why he used to call you my cake. <laughs> Allah protect us. Allah safeguard us. That little call for a few moments has resulted in eternal suffering. Or should I say long term suffering, if not eternal. Because you trapped. You want to return. You cannot return. Why? You made a mistake by not dressing appropriately in the first place. Allahu Akbar. It's a very important example. The brothers as well. We have sometimes because of something we've done outwardly or a place we were found at. You know, you go to a club. Uh, this has happened re in real life where a brother went to a club and he came back and about a year later he came to me. He told me, I've got a very big problem. I said, what is it? A young lad and supposedly religious. He says, last year sometime with a group of friends, you know, we were hanging out and we went to this club and we spent three hours in the club. I said, Astaghfirullah, did you engage in Tawbah? He said, every day. Listen to this, every day I cry to Allah. So I said, so ya akhi, Allah will forgive you. He said, I've got a bigger problem. I said, what's it? I'm a father. Do you know what he's saying? He impregnated someone in one night. I said, ya akhi, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open your doors. You know, now what do we say? We're living in an environment that is not an Islamic environment. And he's crying more and more and I'm trying to... What should I do? Comfort him, admonish him, or try and tell him we're trying to give him a little bit of hope, at least inshallah, don't worry, you can still... He says, no. He explains to me, I'm a father of three children. I said, how are that? He said, she delivered triplets. <laughs> we can laugh at it, but it's shocking, it's a true story. And he says, I've never been to a club before that or after that. And then I thought to myself, Allahu Akbar, a moment of pleasure, which was not actually pleasure, but following the nafs, and wallahi, look at the result. My sisters, that sister was not a Muslim, but that could happen to anyone if you let your guard down. Be careful. I'd like to think your iman, your Islam, your virginity is the next most valuable thing you own. Allahu Akbar. Yes, your deen. Thereafter, it's your chastity. You're a mu'mina. You're a lady protected. That doesn't mean the men shouldn't. But a woman, subhanallah, society may never forgive her. Do you know how it is? Allah will. And Allah always does. But you may have scratched your slate in a way that that scratch will always appear on your mirror. Brothers, don't think you can get away with it. In the sense that the only way forward is engage in tawbah. And in fact, before that, don't fall in that path. Control yourself. And this is why we are taught to lower our gaze. For what? So that we don't even go in that direction. Imagine I'm only speaking about the connection of the opposite sexes. We haven't yet gone into anything else. And we've spoken about dress code, how it can affect you. One little fling and what can happen. Haram relation. Haram relation. If you don't cut it now, it comes back to haunt you. Last night I spoke about how sometimes when you have had your nikah, your marriage, the sacred union which will result in a progeny who will be the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come from that sacred union and the party you had in order to celebrate such a sacred union was a free for all mixed party with a lot of music and dancing. Sometimes we've hired you know, people to come and uh, dance on the floor and everybody comes and I've known Muslim functions that have served alcohol claiming that this is only for the non-Muslim guests. A'udhu Billah. A'udhu Billah. A'udhu Billah. If that's the case, if you have not engaged in tawbah thereafter, if you have not engaged in sincere tawbah and shed tears for what wrong you did the day you got married, it will come back to haunt you, either in the form of absolutely disobedient children or in the form of some form of difficulty that Allah has chosen for you because you're playing a game with the Creator who is the owner, the one in control, the one who can release the sky now. The one who can open the ground now. The one who can cause anything to happen at any time. He is the owner. Don't play games with him. I have a friend. You might know him. Sonny Bill Williams. He's a boxer and a rugby player. If he were to come here, he's taller than me about so much, I think. Imagine he, he's got 
you know, six pack solid guy. Mashallah. And if he were to say salam alaikum to you, you know, your hand, you like, like, like this, you know, when he's finished with you, you're like, oh, subhanallah. And he just shook you normally. Imagine if he had to squeeze, what would happen? And if he was there and you had to do something, you know, like swear him or something, I don't think anyone would dare do that because, you know, he could perhaps just lift you up and say, hey, what's going on? You know? We are frightened of human beings because we see them physically in front of us as stronger than us. But we're not frightened of Allah, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, who owns your eyes and your nose and your breathing and your heart and your, your entire system in there, your digestion, the works. He owns absolutely everything. You're not worried about that? You still want to displease Him? Well, the effect of it will come back, but there's a way out. Delete and enter. Why we say delete and enter is because of the following verse. When Allah speaks of those who will be receiving double punishment, He says, except those who have repented, believed and done good deeds thereafter, we will convert those bad deeds on the other side of the scale as good deeds, subhanAllah. What this means is, you repent and after repentance you do good deeds. One narration makes mention of how if you follow up the bad deeds with good deeds after tawbah, they will be wiped out completely. And as for the minor sins, sometimes they are wiped out as you're engaging in more and more good deeds. Subhanallah. Major sins require specific tawbah. You need to know I was wrong, I regret, I ask for forgiveness and I'm not going to repeat. Four conditions. Allahu Akbar. If that's met, wiped out. Deleted, entered. Gone. Allahu Akbar. Now let's get to the issue of sustenance. Sometimes, you know, back at home, we have a problem. What's the problem? I don't know if you face it here. The lottery, the guys in the line are Muslimin. Sometimes you see Muslimat standing in the line to buy tickets, tickets of the lottery. And you tell them, Sheikh, this is haram. You say, no, there is a fatwa that came from one corner of somewhere that says there's nothing wrong with this. Those are not fatwas, they are fatwas. Allah, may Allah protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Wallahi. You know what happens? They would lose their money or if they won the money, the excitement of the win results in their downfall. Just like a man who consumes interest or a man who has earned haram or a female who has earned sustenance through haram, what happens? That wealth, they may be excited for a moment to say, I achieved and I got. It will not be spent in the pleasure of Allah, but in the disobedience of Allah. And it will not come about with any goodness, the energy that your body derives from that which is haram will never achieve satisfaction except through haram. So the Quran says, This verse has several meanings, I'll mention one of them. The one who consumes interest, for those who consume interest, they do not stand, except like the standing of he who is possessed by the devil. So you could say, their thinking is warped completely as a possessed person. Or you could say when they are resurrected, that's also included in there. Or you could say, the way they behave, the way they carry themselves is absolutely unacceptable. Yes, yet they may think they are doing something good. Subhanallah. They won't understand and realize. You see, when I put a morsel of haram in my mouth, it may have tasted good. Astaghfirullah. Allah protect us. And we might be excited. I afforded so much. Your income was haram. Okay, what happens? Your tongue curses you. The throat, esophagus going down. The little intestine, the, the colon, everything cursing you, doesn't want to be there. You've now got energy from the food that you've eaten, which is haram or from a haram source. So now you, the energy comes into your eyes, your brain. So your eyes are not quenched, quenched your eyesight, unless you look at haram. So your wife, ugly. Why? Because your consumption is haram. 
You see? But when you look on the street, wow, okay, okay. Brother, that's not yours, you're not going to get it anyway. Don't look. It's no waste, don't waste your time. And if you do, it will be through haram. Allah protect us. So you're not quenched unless you look at haram. When you think, you're not quenched unless you think dirty. You think perverted thoughts or haram thoughts. And you start thinking things against Allah and so on. Because you're, the energy being used now is de- derived from a haram source. What do you expect your brain to be used for? You need to engage in tawbah to purify your system. This is why there is a narration that says, that piece of flesh that is built through haram cannot enter Jannah because it is preferred to be in hellfire. It needs to burn out there. Then you enter Jannah. Why should we do that? And this is why we say, if you're hooked onto pornography, or if you find yourself very, very attracted to haram, ask yourself, how's my income? What am I doing? Perhaps there are other haram things which I'm doing which have clustered together all this haram. You're paying for it. You might have just had, you know, one bout, 20,000 pounds interest or the lottery of 200,000 pounds. And what happens? Thereafter, you, one by one, you're making payments until your reproductive system is contaminated. And I don't even want to go further. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us tawbah. We are so fortunate. Imagine the mercy of Allah. Allah has given us a gift known as repentance. Wallahi, I sit and I think to myself, Ya ilaha al-alameen, how merciful you are. You've given us a way to just say, I'm sorry. And you always say, it's okay. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Imagine you harm someone. I'm sorry. They're going to keep on saying, okay, 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 it's okay. There is a limit to it. I'm sure you know the story of the three, you know, the pious guys in the masjid. If you don't know it, you have to do a bit of Googling, inshallah. Uh, you cannot get away with it all the time. But with Allah, He says, don't worry. You repent, you have that genuine repentance with the conditions, we will forgive you. And this is why we say, the hands of those who have eaten haram, will never ever be satisfied unless they touch haram. Unless they feel haram. The legs will not be happy unless they work, walk towards haram. So engage in tawbah so that you can actually resolve that matter. Purify yourself once again. This is why we say Rasulullah engaged in tawbah so many times a day. How many do you do it a day? How many times? He did not need it to be honest with you, but 100 times up to a hundred times a day, he used to say, Ya Allah, forgive me. I am guilty of not following the, that sunnah according to the method it's supposed to be followed. And I'm sure we all could do much better than we are. May Allah open our doors. So this is the little contentment that you might have of haram income, how it contaminates your entire system. And then your mind is dirty, your eyes are dirty, your nose is dirty, everything, your hands, your legs, your feet, whatever else. May Allah safeguard us and grant us goodness. The same applies to these little moments that we engage in sin. If a person has to die in that condition, wallahi, you're doomed. Then we say the door of tawbah is, will not help you. Doesn't help you. In Allah Ta'ala yaqbilu tawbah al-abdi ma lam yugharqi. Tawbah is acceptable up to the point of gargara. Gargara is one of the stages of sakarat when you're about to die. One final stage known as gargara. Up to that point you can say, Ya Allah forgive me. Ya Allah do this. Ya Allah I, I ask you, you know, I repent and so on. Allah will forgive you. That will go down in your book. But beyond that point, no, the door's closed. It's too late. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about these oppressors, the ones who have oppressed against themselves, the, one who've enga- the ones who have engaged in that which is absolutely unacceptable. Then Allah says, حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ رَبِّ رُجِعُونَ لَعَلِّي أَعْمَلُ صَالِحًا فِي مَا تَرَكْتِ كَلَّا إِنَّهَا كَلِمَةٌ هُوَ قَائِلُهَا Allah says when death comes to them, they would say, Oh our Rabb, grant us a return. 
Why can't you return? We want to go back and do good deeds. Now we know, now we've seen. Allah says, nay, it's just a statement they're uttering. It's just a statement. Had they been made to go back, they would have repeated the same thing again. Allahu Akbar. May Allah not make us from those. So these are moments that sometimes we spend thinking that this is pleasure. And you don't realize it is like a seed that is sown. So bad that when the tree grows, the only way out is to cut that tree out and replant. Allahu Akbar. Don't underestimate how a little sin can change your life towards what is negative. Don't ever underestimate that. Remember, for the pleasure of Allah, you need to hold yourself back. You need to understand. You know, we have Salatul Fajr. If you notice, up to now, I've spoken about the importance of abstaining from the displeasure of Allah which might be within someone's, within the pleasure of one's nafs for a moment. We've concentrated on that. But now I'd like to speak about the difficulty that one should endure if they find it difficult in order to obey the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to abstain from prohibition, that's one thing. But to engage in your obligations and fulfill them correctly, that is another thing. So you would need to get up for Salatul Fajr, you would need to engage in that which you are supposed to, and it might require an effort. It will definitely require an effort. Initially, when people are not so used to reading Salah, you know, they might feel very lazy. You have no option. You have to get up. It's routine. It is something. Salatul Fajr, don't say, I'm lazy. No, throw the laziness out. Wallahi, if you have a train to catch or a plane to catch, you will be there 50 minutes ahead of, 15 minutes ahead of time. What if it is your plane into the Akhirah? Are you going to get up for Salatul Fajr? What if Allah says, you know what, this is the last Fajr you're going to be able to read. And you're snoring away. It can be. And this is why we say, do not delay your Salah, subhanAllah. You don't know if... Your moment might be before the ending time of that particular salah. Allah alone knows. Don't delay. Fulfill it. It's not an option. It's an obligation. You have to. You have no option. And if you think you have an option, Allah, it will result in regret. A lot of regret. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. Then we have other moments where people lose their faith. Long term. Say a person gets sick and ill. We have a difficulty in society where as soon as someone gets ill, the first person they run to is someone who they claim knows the unseen. Ahudu billah. No, knowing the unseen? That's your iman gone. It's literally sold. Gone. You've actually sold it for nothing, for a tuppence. Allahu Akbar. Knowing the unseen? Yeah. They told me my sister-in-law did magic on me. Ahudu billah. That sheikh himself, there's a difficulty with his iman. To start with. They told you your sister-in-law? No. They are communicating with the jinn. Believe me, and the jinn are making a mockery of everybody. They cannot tell you who did what. Never, ever. No ways. If they did, there is a problem with their iman. And if you believe them, there is a bigger problem with yours. You cannot do that. Shaitan makes you destroy your family relations. So every time someone is sick, brother... You are limping because of what you did last night and tomorrow morning you're blaming your sister-in-law for that. Why? Because Sheikh told you that. Allahu Akbar. Be careful. That's your iman lost. Lost. You cannot do that. Allahu Akbar. So if you have a sickness, like I said, you need to do what is acceptable in Islam in order to help yourself. You, you seek medication, you make dua, and you constantly perhaps engage in the uh, duas of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, or even if you're just asking dua in your own language, and you're reading perhaps the Quran, and you're uh, engaged in salah, crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure you, you might want to use, as I said, different medication, go for some cupping, perhaps may utilize some, 
some raw honey with a little bit of black seed at the same time, some dates, perhaps the ajwa, perhaps some olive oil, perhaps zamzam and so on. And you want to use what the Quran says there is shifa in and what is taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you may also visit a doctor and have some medication and so on. Constantly make dua up to that moment, inshallah, by the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you've engaged in is okay. But the minute you start going to the superstitious doctors, they call them witch doctors. Allah, you people are doing this. And sometimes a witch doctor is given the name of a sheikh. But he's a witch doctor. He doesn't tell you that. Sometimes he doesn't know that himself. Wallahi, it's haram for someone to come and tell you or to claim and for you to even believe that he knows even a little portion of the unseen. He doesn't. He doesn't. Believe me. And if the jinn have helped him arrive at an answer, he's been fooled. Because the jinn is just lying. Their job is to break family relations. All the time, when people have come to me, they say, well, I was told it's one of your family members. Every time they say that. What nonsense. Don't you know the plan of the devil? The devil is the one who wants to break your family. That's why he does that. It's not one of your family members. Those are innocent people. They are the closest to you. Develop your link with Allah. You should learn why the last two surahs of the Quran were revealed. So as a result of that little small temporary moment of pleasure where you were so excited, finally I've been told who it was. As a result of that, your family tie is broken, your link with Allah is knocked out, everything is gone and the, the, what happens is you still think you're doing something good and you think I'm getting Jannah, but you don't realize I've involved in what is known as shirk billahi rabbil alameen. I've associated partners with Allah. So Shaitan is happy. He's now left you and he's gone to someone else. Why? He knows this one, gone, lost, out. I succeeded. Shaitan is waiting at every path for me and you. He's waiting. He says, I will stand in front, behind, on the sides. Waiting in ambush. Every little opportunity he gets, he's going to pounce. So be careful. Watch out for him. Look out for him. On a daily basis, he comes to me and you. If you think your day has passed without shaitan having come to you, you have not reflected and pondered deep enough to find out how did he try coming today. Lord. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify myself and yourselves. So this is why we say, my brothers and sisters, a little moment that you might feel is a pleasurable moment. Wallahi, it can create a lot of disaster. Be careful. Be careful what you do online. Be careful what you do with your mobile phones. Be careful what you do with your relations. Be careful how you dress. Be careful how you work. Be careful where you work. Be careful what you do. Be careful of your link with Allah. You need to make sure you've developed. You need to make sure you've read your salah. You need to make sure you are worried about the next salah. That is a, that is a quality that will keep you from this small temporary false pleasures that result in crying forever after. Because if you've read Salah and your mind is already connected to the next one, between the two, by the will of Allah, you'll be protected from a lot. If by the will of Allah, inshallah. And when you've read the next Salah, you're worried about the next one, you will be protected again. And if you really think the world is all about enjoying as much as you can and having as much fun as you can, you've actually lost it. In the sense that you don't know why we're in the dunya. You can enjoy within the limits of Allah. You can enjoy within the limits of Allah. Nobody is saying divorce yourself completely from the pleasure of Allah. No. Meaning from something which might be uh, enjoyable within the limits of Allah. Allah says we've given you. We've allowed you. We know what you want. But we've restricted you. Follow our restrictions. And I want to end with one final bit of advice. And that is, my brothers and sisters, everything that Allah has made prohibited, he has made it prohibited because of its damaging effect upon us within the dunya first and then in the akhirah. So when Allah says this is haram, don't think that okay I might get away with a bit of it. Never, you won't. Maybe for a moment you might you know, get excited, be happy. If that is wrong, it is wrong in order to protect you, your dignity, your deen, your iman, your contentment, your happiness, your offspring, your family and everything to do with your goodness. It's protecting you. So stay away from it. When Allah says dress like this in a specific way, 
It is to protect you, to raise your rank, your dignity, to give you contentment, happiness, to protect you from all the evil around you, to keep you in a position that you are supposed to be in so that you are not abused and used and so that you are not tampered with and so that you are respected. The hadith speaks of hijab, sorry, the verses of the Qur'an speak of hijab. And then Allah says, it is better for them so they are recognized and not abused. They're not harmed. Subhanallah. Today a female has been reduced to a sex tool. Wallahi. They want to sell tires and they have a naked woman. I wonder what it's got to do with a tire. A motor vehicle tire. She can't even change it to save her life sometimes. She's got to stop for a male to pass by. Allahu Akbar. Nowadays, mashallah, you've got a few of the strong ones. My sisters will say, brother, you need some help. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allah make it easy. Jazakumullahu khayram. May Allah bless us all. So, this is how they've been reduced to an object. Look at those who have accepted Islam from amongst the non-Muslims who used to bear it all for a living. Wallahi, there are some. I've come across a sister who used literally exactly what I said. She used to work for Playboy. She accepted Islam and she's now properly dressed and she's actually given an interview. You might find it on YouTube, subhanAllah. And she says a few powerful words. You might take a word or two from someone like that. You might learn a thing or two, subhanAllah. And we who have been blessed by Allah sometimes to be born Muslimin, we are abandoning our dress. What a shame. I always say, Allah says, we will replace you if you're trying to be like that. We will replace you. So Allah is replacing one by one. May Allah save God us. My brothers and sisters, anything that is haram is haram in order to protect you and for your goodness and in order to help you achieve contentment in this world and in order for you to sail through the akhirah into paradise. May Allah grant that to us. And anything that is made obligatory and farah, compulsory upon you, is only done in order to achieve the same. So your dignity, your focus, your success in the dunya, your contentment is through salah, through dhikr, through Quran and so on. You know, Allah says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Those who believe, what do they achieve the calmness of the heart from? From the Qur'an, from the reminder of Allah, the reminders, the adhkar, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You read the Qur'an, try and understand its meaning, protect yourself from that which is an innovation and that which is association of partnership with Allah in any way, see the contentment you feel. See how happy you become. See your link with Allah develop. Today people develop a link with a human being and they get excited. I know this guy. He doesn't even know whether he's going to paradise or not. And what do you think? You're just going to cling on to him. Cling on to your maker. He owns Jannah. He will give it to you. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Did you hear that? Cling on to your maker. He owns Jannah. He will give it to you. Subhanallah. If you're clinging to him. So this is why we say whatever is compulsory is for your benefit. If you don't understand it, you're like a little child. A little child who's playing with a knife, throwing it up. And dad says, hey, leave the knife. So he puts it down, comes back. When dad is not looking, he can take it again, playing. Hey, watch out. Goes back. This guy takes it again. As he throws it up, it hits his eye. Lost my eye. Dad! Dad! Dad says, didn't I tell you not to play with a knife? We are worse than that child who did that. Why? Because Allah is telling us not to play with things that are haram. And we continue playing. And the beauty is, you cannot hide from Allah. He is ever watchful. He knows what you are doing. And you're still playing with the knife. When your eye is bust one day, something worse than an eye being bust is when your akhirah is bust. What's going to happen? Allah is going to say, I, didn't I tell you? Didn't I warn you? وَسِيقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ جَهَنَّمَ زُمَرًا حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءُوهَا فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُهَا وَقَالَ لَهُمْ خَزَنَتُهَا 
ألم يأتكم رسل منكم يتلون عليكم آيات ربكم وينذرونكم لقاء يومكم هذا قالوا بلى ولكن حقت كلمة العذاب على الكافرين In سورة زمر Right at the end Allah says the people of Jahannam will be driven to Jahannam in groups when they get to its door the door shall be then opened and the gatekeepers of hellfire will say but didn't the messengers from amongst you come to you reciting the verses of Allah and warning you of this day and they will say yes indeed but no what would have happened they would have not taken heed and therefore they would be punished may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that so did messengers not come to you from amongst you warning you, reading the verses of Allah, reminding you about the signs of Allah, and encouraging you to do that which was good, warning you of the day that you're going to meet Allah. The answer is yes. They came. They delivered the message. What did you do about it? Did you still engage in those little temporary pleasures which resulted in long-term downfall? Or did you turn back to Allah in tawbah? Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. No matter what you've done. No matter what you've done. Allah loves you. And Allah definitely does love you. You are the one who needs to pick that love up by understanding. He's just waiting for me to turn to him. Repent to Allah. Promise Allah not to do it again. And do not fall and falter. And if for some reason your foot slips a little bit, immediately pick it up, clean your foot and carry on walking. What that means is, if you find yourself faltering slightly this way, that way, pick that up. Engage in tawbah and turn back to the path and continue walking. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. It's been really a good afternoon this uh, afternoon here in Birmingham. We thank Allah for bringing us together. We hope and pray we've taken a thing or two. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to obey His instruction. For indeed, happiness is in the hands of Allah. He owns it. We cannot seek it through His displeasure. So you cannot seek happiness through the displeasure of the owner of happiness, you're actually playing a game that is very dangerous if you're doing that. The best thing for me and you to do is to turn to Allah. May Allah grant it to myself. May He make this a means of, inshallah, our entry into paradise. Until we meet again sometimes, perhaps in Birmingham, we say, وَصَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَمَ وَبَارَكَ عَلَى